So, Dr. B, I'm on. I'm, there you go. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, well, well, well. So, I'm going to can step away. Dr. Jackson? Yep. I can hear you. Okay. So, I'm... Okay. And you see the one uh, s screen of my presentation for lecture four. Okay, so lecture four is a, is that the same as lecture one? No, well it will be, but I've included some additional content on this. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. But it, it will have um, uh, a, a good description of the pinouts for the AD86, and we're going to talk a little little bit about Nesby, and I've got a, a short video. Um, motivational kind of video to talk about engineering and art and science and I'll be right back Thank <laughs> you. 
Dr. Biamam, if you could put the uh, camera pointed down just a little bit so I can see perfect right there. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay. So I just handed out the stuff that was embedded in the uh, in the email. Okay. All the students have that right now. And I'll just kind of tell them what that is and then we'll get started. Okay. Um, Uh, there's a, is that a nasty video today? Oh, they left yesterday. So a lot of, several of the students may be gone today to the nasty Yeah, the conference. I actually have a slide that's going to talk about that. Okay. Please be sure to pick up the handout as you come in. Don't forget, uh, you have the next one in your email. Um, Yeah, uh, bar barely, but I can, I can hear you. Okay. Is the camera okay? Yeah, camera's fine. so that they can print out several slides at one time, so that they can reduce the amount of paper. On oh, okay. Notes. Yeah, so put like four up on a page. Yeah. Right, okay. So, I think um, I, yeah, we, so I could do that. I will be emailing you a more condensed version of this with four slides on a page. So, Dr. Biam, what I could do is just uh, email you the actual PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Me and I will provide them. Now this one's a little difficult because I embedded a video in it, so and I, I, it should be. Um, I tried to update it to my Google Drive, and so it should be up there. And I'll email you a link to it. And that okay. way you can download it because it's pretty. It's a it's a large file. It's like 40 megabytes, which might be a little bit too big for your email. Okay. And so uh, I'll do that. Okay, so whenever you're ready to start, I'll get going. Okay. So pick up, please pick up handouts at the back desk, please. And then I'll find the emails and then we'll get started. So 
So if you look at your handout, what I did, we're still following the syllabus. Not a lot has changed since the first day of class. Several of you told me that you felt like you didn't have a lot of direction. So this is to put it all back on the same page. So what I have here on the first page is the table, which I copied from your syllabus. Um, so Dr. Lee actually stopped according to what she's told me. She started in chapter six, right? So the purpose of the first half of the class was to introduce you to the software portion, the assembly. And the purpose of the second half of the class, which if you notice there's week nine, Dr. Jackson began taking over the class, is to introduce you to the hardware portion of the class. So because the first half of the class, the second half of the class, relatively different. One is software, one is hardware. You can jump into, into this hardware portion without covering chapter seven. Okay? So you're fine in terms of the knowledge that you have to get into the hardware part. On the first week, which was last week, we had to work through a lot of the challenges of trying to get this lecture done. I mean, trying to get this process working, and I think we're pretty much we're pretty much out of process now. So we'll just take the week number ten, and this is basically um, it was, we were supposed to start chapter nine, but I think I told Dr. Jackson chapter ten, so that's my fault. So we're going to go back over that first lecture this week in chapter nine. I sent this to you in email. And all of the videos that you see up here are embedded in that email. All you have to do is click on them, and you can review those videos. So as of today, we're on week 10, March 27th, and we're covering Chapter 9. Although we've seen this lecture 4 is really the first lecture that Dr. Jackson gave, that was actually Chapter 9, and he's going to be reviewing that. He did that with the video. There's something in here to help with your learning and introduce you to some other topics. But it is the lecture that you have in your video. I mean, I'm sorry, in your email, which is this lecture. Okay? And so because of the large drawings in the lectures, I highly recommend you print these before coming to class and kind of write on notes because it'll be difficult to take notes. In addition to that, the second page that you have is your new homework assignment. That homework assignment is also attached to the email but I've brought a hard copy just to make sure we're all on the same page. So this homework assignment will be due. We'll still follow what Dr. Lee said on every Tuesday. So this homework assignment, which is covering chapter nine, will be due on Tuesday, okay? All right, so we should be on the same page. Okay, Dr. Jackson, let's get started. Okay, good, good morning, everybody. How's, how's everybody doing? So I'll get started with, with the lecture here. So, um. As Dr. Vimam said, uh, this is really the first lecture, even though it says lecture number four. I did that because we've met, you know, three times already. Uh, here goes the agenda, uh, and if you can't see this, just let me know, and I'll rewind. So um, I'm going to start with the moment of silence, because I understand there was a death in the faculty for Prairie View. We're going to talk about NSBE, uh, the National Society of Black Engineers. This weekend is their 40th anniversary for their annual conference. And then we're going to do a review of what uh, we talked about, or I talked about in the last uh, week, last two weeks. And oh. this Dr. Jackson, before we get started, uh, uh, we have a few students who may have questions. How can they indicate to you that they would like for you to stop such that they, you can answer questions? Um, they just have to speak up. Um, can you see uh, this young man right here in the front? Put your hand up. Yes. Okay, so I will ask him to put his hand up when, when someone has a question. Okay, so. All that, right. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Okay, so back to the slides here. So, um, let's see. So, for the agenda, so we're going to take a little uh, moment of silence, Nesby 40th anniversary. We'll do a, a quick review of the last th two or three lectures and talk about this new approach to teaching because. Um, this video Hangouts, Google Hangouts, is a new approach for pedagogy, that is the, the, the method and the technology of teaching. And I'm trying to integrate more videos because the um, material, um, the 8086, has been around since I was, you know, 30, 40 years. And um, there's been a lot of content that's been generated, and that will take a lot of that to help us learn the material for the book. 
Um, the lecture is going to be about chapter nine again, and then um, Q and A question and answers throughout this lecture. And I'll th I don't think there's a quiz today, and then we'll do a conclusion at the end. So maybe Dr. Vimam could just say the name of the young woman who passed away at, at uh, Purview last week, and we'll do a moment of silence. Actually, the young woman who passed away is Dr. Um, Smith Hollins. She, um, she was actually the one who coordinated all the NED trip that the students are going on today. And um, so our memorial service is today at 12 o'clock in the Bryant Thank you. Amen. Okay. So, the NSBE, the National Society of Black Engineers, is the largest undergraduate organization uh, in the country, if not the world. And every year they have a conference and they bring tens of thousands of people to uh, whatever city that they, they go to. And they've been, you know, I've been there in, in um, Pittsburgh, I've been there in, in Boston, I've been there in, in Houston, I've been to a number of them, and this year they're having it in Nashville. So what I want to try and do is show you their web page. And uh, let's see. Because they have a really nice video that I would love for you guys to see. So tell me if you're seeing this video or not. You're not seeing it? No. Okay. Let's do this then. Uh, that, and we'll do. Oops. Are you seeing it now? No. Okay. Well, this is a really good video about Nesby and some of the stats that are happening. Um, so I'll just read them to you real quick. So it says here. Out of, you want to place it in the chat so I can get the link? I'm sorry? You want to place it in the chat so I can click on the link? Yeah, okay. It's just the nesby.org is the uh, the website. Oh. I want to thank everybody for the patience that you uh, you're giving. Welcome. I know this is uh, a new and an interesting way to to have a class because I'm not physically there. But we're trying to make the most of it. Okay, we're in. What do okay, we need so to the we the look, see the blue uh, square on the right hand side, lower right corner. Uh -huh. It says uh, videos. Just go ahead and click on that. Anybody see that? Right hand side, lower right corner. Yeah, it should be a blue box. It's underneath videos. Okay. And if you can make that full screen by clicking on the look on the lower right corner of that window, there's a, a way you can magnify the screen. Is that the one? 2011, which one do you want us to click on? Which one do you want us to click it's on? A, it's there's okay. Anybody see? There's, there's a banner that says videos in a blue box there. It's a to the right, the lower, lower right corner of the screen, not the complete bottom, but towards the towards the bottom. And then underneath that, you'll see uh, a, a play. What's the name? It's not really a name. What's so, if you, hmm, hard to you see something that's uh, relative relative to uh, six six thousand eleven under videos, which one do we click on? I should be un if you look if, under videos. You should see a a, uh, a blue box, 
And underneath that box, or in th within that box, is an arrow to play. Not an arrow, but a, a diamond, a triangle. And if you click on that... Okay, C212? No, it's above that. But that's it, because I hear it in the background. Now, I have some interesting t t statistics about African Americans and Nesby and engineering and graduation rates. Can you read that? It says other eighty five thousand Bachelor of Science degrees awarded in two thousand eleven, only three thousand four hundred and fifty seven were awarded to African Americans. 85,000 total awards, only 3,400 were given to, to African Americans. Approximately 50% of African Americans graduate high school with their classmates. Dr. Fema, I hear it playing in the background, so... ...experience for kids, and it's put on by the National Society of Black Engineers. And Nesby's mission is to increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers. To increase the number of culturally responsible black engineers. ...to excel academically. To excel academically. ...succeed professionally. ...succeed professionally. ...and positively effective. And I feel that SEEK is literally the embodiment of the Nesby mission. A new program helps to put minority kids at the forefront of engineering. Damon Singleton has that story and much more when we come back. And the goal is to get more minorities to become engineers. And thanks to a summer program, students' interest for engineering is growing. So the purpose of SEEK is just simply to expose these children at a very early age to engineering with the expectation that when they go to college, they'll major in engineering and four to six years later, they'll graduate with engineering degrees. And we really need to have a full pipeline of engineers for the future. We really think it's vital that you get them early in the process. These are third to fifth graders we're hitting right now. And the idea here is to open up a young mind to the science and math. And ultimately, that leads to them being hopefully engineers or scientists or even educators in the field of science and technology. Here is a portal to the gateway, the fulcrum here, the lever here, and the lever here. There are external sponsors who partner working with a nonprofit organization, working with college students who are giving back to third through fifth graders in the communities to build our future. Well, we're interested in America's talent, and we see NSBE and the SEEK program as an opportunity to gain access to that talent. Diversity sparks innovation, and so we need to go through all, all of the hamlets of America to find that talent. We're basically a technology company these days. We're not an old utility. The old utility model is long gone. We're now looking at innovation and, and, and how we create new ways to serve our customers. And we realize that if we need smart engineers, we want to hire engineers that are here in San Diego that, that, that we can help produce. We are going to tell you about Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. The need for new generations of engineers is important to SAE. When SAE partnered with Nesby uh, five years ago to create this program, we knew that the only way to really diversify the pipeline was to get access to students at the earliest ages in underrepresented communities. When students leave a seat camp, the likely outcome is that they're going to want to pursue and learn more about science, technology, engineering, and math. How many engineers do we have? How many teach engineers? Oh, <laughs> The curriculum that we use here in SEEK has been provided by SAE, and it encourages project-based learning. And this is how we teach the students engineering-based concepts that they'll be using throughout the entire three weeks of the camp. 
written second law says mass times acceleration equals force. Inclined plane just gave it more speed. The purpose of the oral presentations is one for the students to be able to show the concepts that they have learned in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in their classrooms. In addition to that, the oral presentations also give the students experience in public speaking. Lastly, it's fun. You know, they enjoy being in front of their peers. They enjoy being able to work in groups and being able to develop as they work in these presentations. What is today? Do? The physical competition is a way for them to use what they've learned throughout the entire week hands-on on the field. It teaches them team building, um, time management, leadership skills. These are all things that they'll be able to use in the real world. I think when you have a space where you can work with other students who look like you and have mentors who look like you, it's it's just a huge influence because you know that you can do whatever you whatever you want to do. I like that Seek is run by the mentors who are college students. They are African American males, females, they look like him and that makes my son say, you know, I can do what they're doing. I'm very excited using appropriate terminology, momentum and conductivity, so I was really proud of him. He was really excited. I like it because it's free. I just returned from a four-day STEM conference, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And all I heard from companies and colleges and universities is we don't have parents who understand the necessity to get their young people excited about math and science. I wish they were in this room right now. I learned how the five phases of engineering design to set goals, build knowledge, design, build and test, and present. And I also learned how engineers solve problems. I learned like what engineers do, and I also learned how to work in teams and how to collaborate with others. As they go out of the camps, they not only have more content knowledge, but they also have a higher interest and affinity for science, technology, engineering, and math. I'm going to be an engineer because I really like it and it's fun. So I was looking forward to bringing Steve uh, back to New Orleans next year and having it grow exponentially. Um, our goal was to target 300 students this year. We met that goal and we're looking to grow it next year even more. SEEK is really limited only by funding. We have potential to expand into many different regions throughout the United States, and that's the goal of both uh, NetB and SAE. We will produce an incredible workforce of engineers, and when we do that, those engineers will spark innovation. That innovation is going to become the steroid shot that we need for a strong, long-lasting, healthy economy. So if I could jump in, um, that was Carl Mack, uh, who was the executive director of Nesby. I believe he stepped down recently. And before that, um, he was actually the NAACP president for the Seattle chapter. And while he was here, he moved uh, uh, and shook it up quite a bit. There was a lot of um, things that he had done to um, make people know that you can't mess around with African Americans. Um, there was a company that was trying to sell Ghettoopoly, uh, which is a, a card-based game, table game that was based on Monopoly, but it used a lot of the racist kind of stereotypical characters in that. And so. Um, Carl Mack actually organized a, a, a rally, a march, and demanded that, that the store, Urban Outfitters, actually pulled it off the shelves, and um, it went nationwide, uh, starting here in Nesby. I'm uh, starting, uh, sorry, starting here in Seattle. So he was a, a groundbreaking force um, to uh, love the community. Um, and beyond that, though, I mean, Nesby is happening this weekend, and it's good that it's still going on. And I would definitely recommend uh, you students there to get more involved in NSBE, the organization, because it will definitely help you out. Uh, so now let's go back to uh, the slides here. All right. 
So videos to motivate. Uh, we already spent, uh, I think, some time. Um, uh, your slides, Dr. Jackson. I'm sorry. I need to get back to your slides. How can I? Yeah, get back to I see them here. So let's see. Um. Oh, I know. I've, I, I'm sharing the wrong thing. Okay. That's, oops. Here we go. That. Chair. And there. Okay, do you see the slice now? They popped in but popped out. You see your picture. Okay, let's try it one more time. Share. Look, our, our students are so anxious to learn micro P. <laughs> That's why I'm going to skip oh. these two uh, videos. So we're going to jump right into uh, the another video, but it's going to talk uh, specifically about um, Chapter 9 and the pin configuration. But I would recommend to go to TED and uh, go to the YouTube um, chat or How to Find Your Passion and Inner Awesomeness. Um, the reason I bring this up is because, uh, for me at least, as an engineer, it took me a long time because I was straddling the fence between the, the nerdy uh, computer engineering side or the artistic um, music side. And so, but, so what I'm doing now is introducing something called art. So it's not STEM any longer. That is, it's not science, technology, engineering, and math. I'm including art. So it would be science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And so that's going to be another way to you know, motivate people to do the best, to be the best they can be, because artistic um, music, there's a lot of timing, a lot of creativity, and that portion uh, of it, so it's not just um, a square nerd, so to speak, it's something that's more artistic, something that's more um, cultural based uh, in, your, in your design and your practices. So. Okay, so, so to help the class uh, kind of give you good feedback, I'm going to request that the students flood you with some emails and talk about your approach and tell you what they like and don't like about this. Yeah, feedback is definitely appreciated. So, so I want you guys to hit Dr. Jackson today and give him your response to today's lectures and approaches so far and the things you want to see to change because they're not used to videos. I think they really want lecture, straight lecture. And okay. So, um, okay. That's what well, this in their comments with that. Well, you'll get those in email. Uh, they want to hear your voice and hear you talk to them, as opposed okay. to the video. Uh, and we'll, we can embed the videos into their their emails, but they want to hear your voice and hear you talk to them about some slides, I believe. Okay, okay. Uh, that's unfortunate because this video I'm about to show is a pin configuration <laughs> of the 8086. So we're gonna do this video, but then the, in the future, I think that's what their preference is, and they'll send you some feedback just to confirm. Okay. Them. Okay, Great, thank you, thank you. All right, here we go. I think what I'll do. Uh, so now this one is a little um, challenging to hear because uh, the person presenting it is has a, a good accent. So can you? We're used to accents. Okay. So can you hear this? Let's go. We're ready. Well, it's playing in the background. Let's make sure you got it. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna go. <laughs> you want to give me a link? Well, see, I, I, it's, it's embedded because it's a YouTube video, but the volume is so low, it's hard to hear. So I worked on it last night to increase the volume, and so it's it's sitting here on my computer, and this okay. is why... I'll okay. email you the actual video file, so it's playing now. We're not able to see it or hear it. No technical difficulty. Uh, guys, this is an adjustment for me too. I'm used to lectures, so 
we're just kind of going to work this out and make this happen. Yes, sir. Can you email him the homework? Pardon? The homework. Can you email it to him? <laughs> Uh, Don Trey, our TA, will be picking it up. He's going to be grading it. Our TA will pick it up on Tuesday. So you will bring your TA, your homework to class. We will pick it up and grade it. Are we are we loaded, Dr. Yeah, Jackson? Yeah, it's playing in the background. I can I can hear you. Actually, we're not picking it up at all. You're not all. picking it up? Okay, let's try this way then. I'll have another way to play it. Give me a second while I pull it up. What am I doing here now? Let's go back to here. Screen share. So I can hear that? No, we're not able to hear it. We can't hear it, Doc. Nope, we're not able to hear it. Hmm. Okay. Well, in that case, then, we'll just go ahead and go through the slides that I had on here. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I'm going to open up another... While he's doing that, guys, let's talk about the lab. How's the lab going? Are you learning quite a bit in the lab? You're learning instruction sets and how to communicate to the registers, and you feel pretty confident. So are you understanding some of the material that, that, that was in the videos earlier? Is the connection happening? Question. Come on, give me some feedback. I need some feedback. Yes. Okay, Dr. Jackson, while you're working on that, we have a student with a question. Okay. If on the pen layout of the microprocessor, that's the 8086, yeah, it has a bar over it. On does, one of the labels. On one of the labels. On one of the labels, does that mean an active output? Active low output. Active low output. Yes. 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 He says, what does that mean when you have an active output? Uh, this, this video is not working, so we can finish it. Come on. He said, um, what does that mean? What do you expect on the output? Well, there is um, in a slide that we talked about, and, and uh, it's actually right here. Uh, you can't see that one. So let's do another screen share. You can see it. Basically, it means if it's going to be positive 5 volts or negative. And there is an actual... Um, uh, Specification of what that means, and it should be right here. Yeah, but my specific question is: got an output, and it's supposed to be uh, a logic zero. Why, why would you output a logic zero? And it's just three, three. He said, "Why would you output a logic zero and just leave the pin out?" But it's not a logic zero; it's a logic negative five. Is that what you're saying, Doctor? Dr. Jackson. Well, uh, it's if you look at this one s slide here, we have the input characteristics and the output characteristics. So for an input characteristic, for it to, for it to be a logic zero, it has to be ne uh, 0.8 volts. So it's not negative; it's either zero volts, zero volts, or 0 0.8 volts. So and logic one is two volts, and there's a plus or minus, you know, milliamps for the maximum amount that you can do. 
for the output characteristics, so logic zero is 0.45 volts. It's not negative. It's either zero or positive. You know, so that zero dash means that it's logic zero means it's 0 0.45 volts for the output. For logic one means it's 0.24 volts. But uh, that wasn't his question. His question was, when he sees the pin layout on the microprocessor chip, right. the output is showing a bar over on the output, right. what does that mean? It means that it's, it's the, the negative. That ne negative in the sense that it, it'll be zero, the 0.45 volts. Does that make sense? So it's not really negative volts, it's just either zero no volts, which we can just um, consider as negative volts. But his question is, why even put the pin as an output pin if it's zero volts? Because it's, it's binary, so it's either on or it's off. So if it's off, that means that there's no voltage or very little volts, like 0.8 volts. Okay, we'll we'll get to that later. We'll we'll, we'll get started in the lecture. We'll come back to this in the class. Okay. Okay. So can you see this this uh, slide 8086 slash 88 hardware specifications? Yes. Okay. So power supply, that's one of the pins and input characteristics for the pins, either logic zero or logic one. Meaning that for logic zero you have 0.8 volts, and for logic one for the input it's two volts, and for the output, logic zero it's 0 0.45 volts, and for logic one it's 2.4 volts. Okay. So it's, there's never a negative voltage on it. It's either zero up to a, a positive of five. And here goes the diagram of all the pins. So what's interesting is that some of the pins are what's considered um, multiplexed. And so pins two to pin, if it's 13, Actually, it's let's see, 15 have AD, so AD and the number. The A and D means it's either address or data, and the the number next to it means that it's you know one of n, one of eight, one of 16, and so by the multiplexing means that half of the time it'll be in this state, the other half would be in the other state, and so for the max and min mode, as um, I we talked about this last week. A max mode is when you have more than one processor on your your um, circuit diagram, and so because it's a max mode, there'll be certain pins that will behave differently in the max mode. And if you look at the diagram, you'll see min mode with the bars around it, and max mode without the bars. Can and so, can you tell us? We don't see max mode, min mode. How do you determine max or min mode? Which bars? Which pins? Well, it's it's a voltage. Uh, it's a, a configuration on the pin that you that specifies whether the chip is in a min mode or a max mode. Again, if it's in a min mode, that means it's basically the microprocessor by itself. And if it's in the max mode, you have more than one processor can uh, specified in your in your design. And then to get into the min mode or the max mode, there are pins that you have to specify, and we'll talk about that uh, in the next slide. But if you look at the, the picture that I have displayed on the screen, if you look at pin 31, it says uh, RG, and then it's hold, right? But if you look on the right side, you'll see that pin 31, it's opposite, where it's the signal... Uh, the chip will be in a hold position when it's in the min mode. So I guess the specification, because when you look at the pins and it tells you what they do, the name of it, on pin 31, there are two different states that that pin can be in if it's in the min mode or the max mode. And so on the left-hand side of that diagram, you'll see pin 31 has RG, RD, G, T, O, and then to the right of it is hold. The hold, since it's got the little things wrapped around it, that would be considered the min mode, right? And so on the right-hand side of the diagram, you'll see that for pin 31, 
there's hold, but it doesn't have the parentheses around it, right? So that, again, represents that it's in the min mode, and when the parentheses around it, that would be the, the max mode. That's just, again, specifying that depending on how the, the circuit, how the pin is configured, will be determined on how the mode of that pin will be, mode of the CPU will be. So it's not only pin 31. There's pin 31, pin 30, 29, 28, 27, uh, all the way down to pin 24. Those have either min mode or a max mode. But then if you look at pin 23, that's always test. Pin 22 is always ready. Pin 21 is always reset because those pins are the same regardless of what m mode the CPU is is put placed in. Okay, and we'll go. We'll talk about that more as we go through the slides. I have a quick question. I think we can, Dr. Jackson. If we go back to that slide, I think we can address Mr. Ford's question. If we go back to that slide, Mr. Ford, are you asking um, about? Oh, because it specifies what state it's in. And so, again, if uh, 29 is one of the um, multiplex lines, and so if it's in the min mode for pin 29, then the lock would be in the max mode, actually. So if it's in the max mode, if the chip, the AD86 chip is in the max mode, then pin 29 specifies the lock uh, condition. And if it's in the max mode, pin 29 specifies the read-write condition. And so when, when we look at the bus timing diagrams, it will give a, a better understanding of what that pin function actually does. And, and so really is what they're saying is that whenever that output goes low, it's in it's locked. Right. And high, it's not locked. That's what that line is. Okay. Right. It's, it's inverted. Right. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so now we're looking at the pinouts again. And so again, because they're the multiplex lines, the address lines 87 and through 80 zero, it's either address 7 through address 0 or data 7 through data 0, and depending if it's multiplex or, or not, those pins will be in that situation. Now, the 8088 and 8086, the difference is between 8 bits or 16 bits. And so on the 8088, you only have 80 zero to 87 because those are 8 bits. Whereas on the 8086, you had 80 zero through 8015. So 0 through 15 is 16. And that's how you have the 16 bits. And so that's for the address and the data bus. But for the 8088, because it's only 8 bits, you see only A8 through A15, right? Those are address lines only. So let's go back one slide and take a look at that. Can I interrupt and ask the class a question? What does it mean, the next line, what is this? These lines are multiplex address and data lines. What do we mean multiplex? You learn that in your logic checking class. You talk about multiplexers. What? Multiplexers are Okay, okay. So he said the answer was when they're multiplex, their addresses, address lines at one part, and then their data lines on another part. They, you can make a selection. Right, so when, when you look at the timing diagram, it'll specify what state the address line and the data bus lines are in. And because you can have a line that can serve more than one purpose, that's why it's called multiplex. So it's either address or data. So it says here address and data, but really it's either or. It can't have both of them at the same time, which is why you have AD7, the AD, meaning either address or data. You can't have both at the same time. And it's all dependent on the, um, the, the timeline. Okay. Okay? All right. So um, 
you have the address bus, you have your data bus, and you have your control bus also. So if you look at A9, I'm sorry, A19, A6, A16, S3, so those three lines, S3, S4, S5, S6, um, give you the status for the microprocessor. And so um, it's at the very bottom it says S6 will always be logic zero. S5 indicates the condition of the IF flag pens. S4 and S3 indicate which segment is being accessed during the current bus cycle. Okay, and in the next slide it should actually um, there's a chart that says what those so, so those S3 pins if you go back to the previous slide that was read the line the ready which is a logic zero indicates I'm sorry any questions okay okay keep going Bob Okay, so you have the RD line, ready line, the interrupt line used for, for peripherals to request a hardware interrupt. And so in other words, when you have something like your keyboard, when you hit a key on the keyboard, that could cause an interrupt to happen in your circuit, meaning that the CPU needs to pay attention to what's happening on your keyboard. Um, test, this pin is, is tested by the wait instruction. Um, and so that means that um, if it's waiting, then it's during the cycle that it has to pause, that it, it being the CPU has to pause before it can move on. Uh, NMI is a non-massable interrupt. Uh, it's similar to the, to the interrupt, but it can't be maxed. Me, maxed. Masked, meaning that it can't be um, changed or interrupted. Okay. Um, now look at the control bus. Uh, the reset bus, I mean, that's pretty explanatory, that if, there, if you have a reset line, then the CPU is going to reset itself. Um, the clock is, will be consistent through the whole entire circuit, and it gives the operation the timing that it needs for the CPU to operate. VCC is the voltage. Uh, GND is ground. Uh, the min mix selects the minimum and maximum mode of operation. And this is how you get the chip to go into that, uh, to the modes that we're talking about. So this one chip can, uh, one pin, I'm sorry, determines okay, whether or not the chip is in min or max mode. If you have your pin layout which on your notes, all of these pins are listed on this layout. And so you can follow him if you're looking at the layout. The reset pin is pin number 21. And the clock pin so you can go back and look at, you should be looking at your pin as he's describing this. You should have this pin layout. It's embedded in the lecture. Otherwise, you're going to feel a little lost. So be sure you have this pin layout. Or it's in the textbook also. What page does the textbook? Page 303 in your textbook. Okay, keep going, Josh. Okay. Just trying to make sure the class is following. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. Okay, so the, the BHE and S7, uh, the bus high enables is used for the 886 to enable the most significant data bus doing a read or write operation. And S7 is always like and the more of the pinout. So each one of these pins, uh, each one of these lines describes the um, condition of a pin that's on the, the microprocessor. So the IOM on the 8088 or the MIO on 8086 indicates the processor is being accessing a memory address or an IO port address. Now because these are two separate chips, the 8088 and the 8086, the, that one pin will behave differently depending on if it's an 8088 or 8086. Um, the WR is for read-write modes of the CPU. Uh, INTA is a signal response to interrupt as being requested. Uh, ALE indicates that the address line or data bus line contains uh, address information. The DTR is a data transmission. Receive indicates that data bus is transmitting or receiving information. And again, a lot of this will make sense when we look at the actual um, timing diagram, which comes a little bit later in the chapter here. 
um, the DEN data bus enable, hold, input receives a DMA request, it's a direct memory access. Dr. Jackson, we have Is there another question? Yeah, there is a question. Hold on one second to the question. Sure. What's your question? On the slides, you have both on your slides. There are two layouts on the slides. On, on the second page, there's both. Uh, Dr. Jackson, his question is, is the pin layout on slide number two, is that an 8086 or 8088? OK, I didn't hear the question. On slide number two, uh -huh. which microprocessor is that? Is that an 8088 or 8086? Okay. One is an 8086, and the second one is an 8088. Uh, you, you know she had reviewed her notes, so uh, it's clear. She <laughs> yeah, but some other people saw it. So. Okay, Dr. Jackson, she answered herself. She reviewed her notes and answered it. Okay, great. Well, it says right in the middle of it that's 8086 CPU. Right in the middle of the actual square or rectangle, it says 8086. <laughs> okay, let's let's keep going, Doc. Okay. I, I tell you what, that, this is what's happening. There are lots of peers, and I don't think it's, we just got to jump in and let's just keep going. Be sure right. to read notes before coming to class. Please continue. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, let's go to um, slide, I guess this is slide eight, and so the pinout for the maximum mode. Here goes the, the three status bits that determine what the function is for the maximum mode. The RO is your next pin. Request grant pin uses the uh, dynamic memory access during maximum mode operation. There's another pin called block used to, to lock the peripheral. Uh, QS1 is for your Q status bits. Um, and then here is the, uh, on slide number nine, the combination of some of the pins for the microprocessor for your status and uh, transmits uh, and bus cycle uh, and what the status of those bits represents. Okay, Dr. Jackson, I have a question. If you go yeah. back to the previous slide. So okay. S2 and S1, if you're looking at the 8086 microprocessor, is that pin number... 38 and 37, those pins? The 8088? I'm sorry, the 8086. Where, where do you find the S1 and S2? What pins yeah, are those? Those are pins. Oh, 28, 27, 26. Okay, I see you. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Because remember, it, it's multiplex, and so depending on the state of the CPU, whether it's in min or max mode, that's going to represent what that pin, the function of that pin is. Okay, okay. so, all right. So the status, let's go back to that page. For the maximum mode, the S2, S1, and S0 indicates there will be eight different um, situations or statuses that the pin would be in, uh, the CPU would be in. And then the next slide here, it shows what, in the middle there, for table 9-6, the bus control, uh, depending what uh, voltages are on those pins, that will indicate what the CPU is doing in that state. Okay, so I know it's a little difficult to understand, but when we when we go through it and look at the actual logic diagram and the timing bus, uh, it'll make a lot more sense. That's so, smart. They can keep up. Okay. All right. So every um, CPU has to have a clock generator chip uh, combined with it. And so the, the clock generator is consistent, and it'll, it'll be um, the foundation of what you need for the CPU to run. Okay, and so it's the 8284 provides the CPU with the clock generation, the reset, ready signal, and the TTL uh, peripheral clock signal. Okay. Now buffering and latching is uh, when you have your data on your CPU on the line. Um, the octal bus, meaning that the S, since octal is what? Three? 
Okay, so transceivers with a tri-state output. So again, optal means that you have three states available, and so the 74LS245 is the bus that you would use to uh, help the CPU along. Okay, and then the 373 is a transparent latch with the tri-state outputs. And so since this is a multiplex CPU, it has three states, you need this additional circuitry to have the CPU run uh, correctly. So now this gets a little complicated, which, uh, but it's, it is what it is. And so on the left-hand side, you'll see your 8086 and the... Hold on, the hold, on, hold, on hold on, Dr. Matt. Are there any questions so far? On the previous slide, the buffering and latching. Are there any questions? Can you go back to the previous slide? Can you go back to the previous slide? Right there? Yes. Are there any questions on this slide? He said, the question is, what are the three states that the latches can be in? I mean, that this bus can be in? Well, it could be reading, writing, or wait. Like an undefined state. Okay, so... If the um, if the CPU is in a read situation, then you'll have certain pins on the CPU to indicate that. If it's in a, a write situation, you'll have again certain pins indicating that. And if it's in a wait state, there will be another uh, pin set of pins, the S zero S one S two pins, uh, will indicate the the situation of of the CPU. So, so the students are used to, because they're coming from logic circuits, and they're used to three terms. They're used to a zero, a one, or an X or a Z, which is an unknown or undefined right. high impedance. Are those the three states that you're talking about? Yes. This, okay. This is zero, one, or high impedance. Right. It can cut off and no current. Right. And so again, when we look at the bus timing, I think it'll it'll kind of all come together. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So here we are looking at the buffering and, and latching. So on the left hand side of there's two actual diagrams here, and the diagram on the left that you'll see on the left hand side of the diagram is your CPU 8086, right? And then so in the middle are the buffering. Um, and latching uh, components that you need. And so because the chip is multiplexed, you'll see that at the bottom you have your AD address and data, and then the signal's coming out. And so if you go from like AD, I guess that's 10, all the way straight across, you'll see that you have your data bus, but the chip, the 7... Uh, 37, I think it's called, is um, going to buffer the address portion of this demultiplex pin, right? So AD can you repeat, zero. Can you repeat? Can you start from the beginning? No. Okay. Start from the beginning. All right. So from the beginning. All right. So you have these two diagrams here, all right? On the left-hand side, complete left, you have the AD86 chip, and you have the pins coming out of the AD86 uh, at the bottom, you have your right and you have your read signals and you have your MIO and address 0 all the way up to address 10 I believe and so those if you go straight across to the right those turn into your data because in the deep multiplex um, situation it's either data or address so whenever it's a data signal you'll have your RD line indicating that and then those lines, since they're, since they're multi, huh? that chip will be activated, and the pin outs the, uh, from the AD lines then it becomes an address line, right? So if you move to the right, you'll see the data bus is your. D0 through D7, and your address line would be from A0 to A10. Or is it 20? 
So this again, just how the multiplexing works between the address line and the data lines. Now on the right hand side you have the 8088 because the 8088 only has 8 bits for your data whereas the 8086 has 16 bits for your data, right? And so you'll see you only need one of the seven uh, 372 chips for the buffering and the latching. Okay, in this case you have the same, not so much the same, but you still see there's an AD indicating it's an address or data and it goes through the 737 to split between either your data bus or your address bus. Now, because of the 8088, there are some pins here that are just one way, meaning there's, there will always be address lines and they're not multiplexed. Okay, which is why for the 8088, you only need one of the 373 chips, whereas on the 8086, you only need two of those because each one of those chips is only four bits wide, those chips being the 373. Okay. Does it make sense? I'm not hearing anything. I see hands up, but I don't hear anything. Is the microphone working? I don't hear anything. Okay, I see you in the chat. Okay. All right, here we go. Mic issues. Yeah. It was working earlier. Okay, maybe you can type in your question in the chat window. So Dr. B Dr. Beamon. Okay, we had sound issues. We missed most of the slide. Can you repeat? We are watching. Okay. All right, so from there. Okay. Okay, so I was saying that because of 8086, it's 16 bits, you'll need two of the 373 chips to demultiplex the data lines. Okay, so this one um, picture, you'll see that on the left hand side you have the 80, 8086, and on the right hand side you have the 8088. And I just transfer, okay. And so um, on the left hand side with the 8086, you need two of the chips for the 373 for the demultiplexing, and for the 8088, you only need one. Um, because each one of the three sets on the left hand side again you'll see you have the AD 0 to you know 16 or 15 to give you your 16 um, address lines but then since it's multiplexed you'll have D0 to 3 through D15 okay so that's the, your data bus aren't multiplexed, 
And so you don't have to worry about, well, at least for the 8088, there are some pens that aren't multiplexed. And so you have A15 through A8. Okay, so if you look on the right hand side, just go straight through. Okay, let's go back and see. And I lost it. Oh, okay. Go back to screen share. Okay.
I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last. Okay. Dr. Bima? Okay. So the, the last thing you said, maybe we can come face to face or? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Right. 